What's up guys, this is Anime Crossover, I'm back with a new episode of What If Naruto Went to the Marvel Universe Part 2 and if you did enjoy the video, give this video a like and if you're new to my channel and like my content, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more crossover fictions. Now let's begin this new video. Chapter 2 The Homestead is covered, and that's exactly what happened. The exhausted blonde finally finished telling the girls about the previous night's events, which included Connor's assault, saving the mayor and his family, fighting the skull-masked kidnapper, and finally the man's death. He could sense Medusa's pain in her eyes because they worked together, while Kuroka, Rhea, and Seiko were gloomy because they had only met the man once, but they knew Connor was a decent man. When Naruto was about to transfer Connor to the homestead grounds for burial, he spotted a single stab wound in the back, specifically the lower back. He couldn't believe Connor was hiding a fatal wound, but what really startled the ninja was the elderly man's lying. Throughout the entire trek to the homestead in the manor, there was no hint of lingering pain or a change in his posture. Connor was a rough son of a gun, to be sure. Naruto had seen his phone vibrating on the table before he could dig the hole for Connor. He had left the device at the mansion before rescuing the mayor and his family, so picture his astonishment and concern when he noticed 28 missed calls and text messages from the apartment, so Naruto chose to postpone the burial slightly to demonstrate his well-being to the girls. He did, however, leave a clone to begin excavating Connor's grave, which should be ready before they arrive. That led to his explanation of the current occurrences. Medusa, unable to hold it in any longer, approached Naruto and held him for comfort as he wrapped his arms around her. They weren't alone, as the other females hugged them to comfort them at this difficult period. They separated somewhat after that to give each other space. Where is he? Back at the manor, Naruto replied before adding, I should go back right now because I need to dig a grave for him. Seiko put his hand on his, We'll accompany you because we want to pay our respects, Naruto said as Medusa wiped away her tears. They noted the lack of sound from their Nekomata and turned to find her staring at Naruto, his new clothes, with curiosity. Your clothes. They're interesting, to say the least, Kuroka confessed as the females finally noticed Naruto's new outfit, it appeared to be rather ancient and a little loose for the blonde, something he hadn't considered until Seiko said it. I have to agree with Kuroka, Rhea said admiringly. Even though it hides your face, which is one of your best features. Medusa and Seiko nodded, but Naruto blushed slightly before shaking his head. Thank you, but we need to go to the homestead now, Naruto said as he proceeded to the infant room and emerged with his sleeping children in his arms, eliciting strange looks from the girls. Oh, and by the way, we have a new house now. A. T T I I P M X T T I I P M X T T I I P M Connors Manor and the Homestead Grounds. Massachusetts is forested. The entire Uzumaki gang was transported to the chilly climate of the homestead via the Hiroshin Kanai Naruto left behind before he departed for the girls, after removing their goods that they managed to purchase during their one month stay, including the twins' baby related items. After settling there, the girls, together with the sleeping infants in Seiko's arms, stood solemnly by Naruto's clone's freshly excavated grave. They heard the door open and out came Naruto and his clones, each carrying a wooden casket with four handles and walking slowly towards the cemetery. Medusa hoped to see Connor one final time before he died, but he was inside the coffin. The coffin was shrouded in a magnificent royal blue shroud that shone slightly in the moonlight. Rhea designed the shroud and coffin because she wanted him to achieve eternal tranquility through two funeral rituals. Naruto dispelled his clones when they slightly lowered the casket, while he and the females stared at the grave with sorrowful emotions and said prayers in their different languages. Medusa held a bouquet of lilies and roses in her hands. She released go of them as they gracefully descended onto the grave. The girls soon went inside one by one, leaving Naruto alone. He took a nearby shovel and began dumping the dirt mound into the grave. The ninja could use a jutsu to help, but this was a burial, and as he had been taught since childhood, the dead should never be disturbed from their repose. This belief pitted him against terrible characters like Orochimaru. Naruto was outraged when he learned that the Sanin had callously resurrected the first and second Hokages against old man Serutobi, and he wanted to beat the living hell out of him even though he was weaker at the time. Time flew by as Naruto completed filling the grave and glanced at the improvised marker, which was a wooden cross. Naruto wanted to respect Connor's religion because he had addressed it in their conversations. I hope you're happy, mentor. Soon after, he felt a soft pin on the top of his head, 
followed by more at a faster speed as it encompassed his body. As it continued to rain in the homestead, Naruto peered up and noticed gray, black clouds overhead. As though the earth realized it had lost a fine person and was mourning its loss. Naruto. Rhea said to Naruto as she stood by the door. Naruto turned back and proceeded into the manor with his arm around Rhea after a few more minutes. As the inhabitants prepared to retire for the night, the door closed. Naruto would have noticed the entire estate shine a brief white light if he had just waited a few more minutes outdoors. TTIIPMX TTIIPMX TTIIPM, Weekly Update, The Helicarrier of S.H.I.E.L.D. New York City, Manhattan, New York The director sat at his podium in a dark room lit only by a single screen that displayed a call from one of the victims of a recent incident. The city of Boston's mayor, the agents aground persuaded him this morning to contact the director about his experience and was Fury. One of their spies had kidnapped the mayor of Boston, but Fury suspected they were up to something. They wanted something from someone with the video from the TV and police helicopters. Fury had no idea what they wanted, but he would find out and make sure they didn't get their hands on it. Hydra was the evil organization that fought against SHIELD's precursor during World War II, and Captain America was and still is fighting the organization in its leader, the Red Skull. Captain America, aside from a spy currently in the field and Fury himself, is the organization's and the world's leading expert and warrior against the Hydra organization. And that is everything, Director Fury. The aforementioned director fixed his gaze on the mayor on the screen. The Bostonian appeared weary, with bags under his eyes from the previous week's paranoia. Fury couldn't blame him for how the man felt, but he needed comprehensive details of what happened so they can prepare. He must be well versed in everything and everyone. And what about the hooded figure? Are you sure he wasn't a part of it? This includes the mayor's rescuer. Positive, the mayor said firmly, his eyes unwavering. Fury locked his gaze on him before nodding and pressing a button on his panel that terminated the transmission. Soon after, four more screens appeared on the wall, before all five contained transmissions of people of various nations, the United Nations Security Council and one of the directors of S.H.I.E.L.D. are responsible for all actions. I assume you've all received the report. Thus began another, exhilarating, day for the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., as the council hammered him with suggestions in the extraction, interrogation, and capture of Crossbones and the enigmatic hooded figure, notwithstanding the latter's heroic deed of the Boston mayoral family. TTIIPMX TTIIPMX TTIIPM Homestead Grounds, Connors Manor. Massachusetts is forested. Naruto held Ashla in his arms, while Masaki sat in Seiko's embrace, watching Rhea deftly prepare another round of her delectable dishes in the basic but efficient kitchen. It was large enough for them all to stand around, with plenty of ingredients and food to go around. Behind Rhea was an old but distinctive stone stove with an open fire, similar to what the colonists used in colonial America, and a stone ventilation above it. Brown wooden cabinets formed a L from the stove to the edge of the kitchen door next to it. How do you know to use that, Rhea? Seiko wondered, as Rhea smirked at her. Seiko dear, I'm immortal, Rhea stated emphatically. I've lived in many places over the years, including colonial America, where I worked as a cook for one of the noble families at the time. The Titanus noticed a twitch in her lover's brow as he glanced at her dryly. I'm guessing the man of the house wanted more than just your cooking. Rhea replied simply while mincing the celery, perhaps. She laughed at Naruto's reaction and swears she saw train-like vapor shoot out of his nose and ears. Don't worry, I rejected him, but I kindly directed his attention to someone else who shared his specific characteristics. As Seiko rolled her eyes, Naruto stuttered nervously while bouncing with Ashla. How much time do we have left until dinner? Not for too long. Okay. Seiko gave Naruto Masaki since she was going to help Rhea bring the food to the table. The ninja proceeded to the adjoining dining room, where Kuroka and Medusa were excitedly awaiting the arrival and consumption of food. The dining room, like the kitchen, was large enough for a very long dining room with a chandelier on the ceiling and a fireplace on the side. The infant chairs were at the far end of the table, where Naruto had placed the twins. When Masaki and Ashla discovered Kuroka and Medusa, they laughed. The former priestess allowed Masaki play with her hair while the Nekomata's tail provoked Ashla to try to catch it with his tiny hands. Naruto smiled at the scene because they were all pleased with their new house. It was awful circumstances, but it was better than their cramped Boston flat. Much better in terms of having eight rooms, four on the first level and four on the second floor, in the manor, 
not to mention the two smaller houses outside the manor. The Uzumaki group spent the entire week exploring the homestead grounds, seeing huge herds and resting sites of foxes, elks, deer, wolves, and bunnies. They uncovered a main walkway that connected the mansion to other run-down structures located at the bottom of the hill across a river bridge. The cove that the estate overlooked from atop the hill, though, was the biggest surprise. The cove not only served as the gateway to the Atlantic Ocean and potential commercial routes, but it also housed a deck and a perfectly preserved wooden ship, most likely from the colonial period. Naruto and Medusa wanted to take the ship for a spin, but Rhea and Seiko decided it was best to make sure the naval vessel was safe to begin with. Kuroka, on the other hand, disliked the ship and anything related to the sea, probably due to her Nekomata ancestry. I'll be back, girls, Naruto promised as he kissed his children's heads and headed up the stairs to the second last room on the left. It was the only room neither he nor his girlfriends had visited all week. The three rooms were largely Connor's family's bedrooms during his childhood. All right, let's see what's in here. Naruto lightly jiggled the knob, hoping the door would be opened, and sighed when it fully turned as he entered the unknown chamber. The blonde entered the room and discovered a table in the corner between two windows, some paintings mounted on the walls, and an empty board at the door. On the other side of the desk was a wall-to-wall -wall shelf full of dusty and web-covered books. With the hanging dust in the room, Naruto coughed a little and considered cleaning it. A small sparkle caught the ninja's eye as he turned around for supper, and he came to a halt. What's that? Naruto wondered as he approached the table, his gaze drawn to the object that piqued his interest. It was a book, dusty from decades of uninterrupted slumber and calm. Naruto grabbed it up before blowing hard to clear the dust and noticed it was leather bound with the assassin insignia inscribed on it, only around the inside were 13 stars. 13 stars, huh? Naruto pondered on one of his conversations with Connor, which covered some history. He quickly remembered the significance. They represent the original 13 colonies. Naruto, it's time for dinner. Naruto turned his head and said, on my way, he returned to the book and placed it back on the desk, knowing it would be there when he returned after closing the door. Naruto descended the stairs and entered the dining room, taking a seat at the head of the table. Rhea sat next to Medusa and Ashla on his right, with Kuroka, Seiko, and Masaki on his left. Thanks for the food, they all said, clasping their hands. TTIIPMXTTIIPMXTTIIPM, nighttime, station of the Boston Police Department. Boston is a city in Massachusetts, the thunderclouds rumbled as the downpour engulfed the city's residents with its uncountable minute droplets. People either went into neighboring buildings to avoid the rain or sat back and relaxed while driving their waterproof automobiles to their destination. The station's police captain, dressed in his weather police coat, stood on the roof with two of his lieutenants, waiting for their national guests to arrive. They didn't have to wait long since the thunderclouds separated somewhat when a large yet rapid object flew through them. The captain knew it because it had all been in the local, state, and national law enforcement conferences given by S.H.I.E.L.D. multiple times over the years for them to become acquainted with the cars. The vehicle was similar to a modern VTOL, vertical takeoff land, aircraft, only it had two strong jet engines at the back and two enormous, angle-adjustable rotors on its wings, allowing it to fly vertically and land. The S.H.I.E.L.D. logo was on the side of the car, indicating that two of its passengers are also members of the organization. The vehicle is known as the Quinjet, one of whom is well known throughout the United States and the entire world. The captain went forward to greet the two agents as the Quinjet's hangar door slowly opened as they watched the flight vehicle descend while its rotors whipped rain and puddles all over the roof. Footsteps sounded against the metal hangar, announcing the departure of the passengers, as the captain and his subordinates stood at attention, hands in salute. The first passenger was a woman who exuded confidence and attractiveness, making the men, barring the captain, regret their marriage. Her beautiful red hair fell below her shoulders, and she had emerald eyes. The lieutenants were drawn to her clothing, which was a black leather skin-tight suit with a belt and a pair of gauntlets with eight cartridge-like mechanisms surrounding its patterns. They didn't need to say anything to introduce the second traveler. He stood a few inches taller than the woman next to him, had short blonde hair in a crop haircut, blue eyes that matched the sky, and stood a few inches shorter than the woman next to him. His clothing was slim, revealing his toned body from the experiment, and featured a contrasting color scheme of red, white, and blue with a lone star on the breast and red gloves that covered the forearms. The mask covered his entire face save for his mouth, nose, and eyes, 
and it had white wings carved on both sides. The discus-shaped shield with four concentric pieces was the most unique and instantly recognizable item of uniform. A white star was emboldened in the center, encircled by blue, with red and white stripes on the three outside rings. The legendary shield is made of one of the most powerful metals on the planet. Natasha Romanov, the Black Widow of S.H.I.E.L.D., was one of Fury's top agents. The man in question was none other than Steve Rogers, best known as Captain America, the commander of the superhero team The Avengers. Captain America returned the salute to the police officers before shaking hands with the captain, causing them to relax significantly. Captain, the young World War II veteran said respectfully. The police captain returned the same courtesy. Captain, the two said before walking to the elevator and descending to the fifth floor. The party of five strolled across the floor, disregarding bystanders, until they arrived at the conference room, when one of the lieutenants shut the door and the other closed the window blinds. I'm assuming you're here for the mayor's family event. Yes, I believe Director Fury informed you of our arrival, Captain America said. Crossbones was all right, but I find it odd that he's waiting for someone. Natasha added her two cents. From the video, this person apparently has something crossbones or, better yet, his employer wants. She crossed her arms, accidentally declaring her breasts more than usual. But this mysterious person is something to ward off someone like crossbones and save the family at the same time. Not to mention quick on his feet, there were explosives around the warehouse from the bomb squad, Captain. The skipper confirmed it with a nod. That's correct. This guy is either the fastest man alive or a mutant. We won't know until we find him, Captain America stated emphatically. Or her. Yes, her. Captain America and Black Widow were left alone in the room as they watched the CCTV footage from surrounding Boston Harbor, hoping to uncover any indication of the rescuer who defeated Crossbones. When they couldn't find any signs, Black Widow had an epiphany. Crossbones had to draw the attention of this hooded figure through the news, right? She declared rather than asking, to which her friend agreed, then we should retrace his steps prior to kidnapping the family. Perhaps they met before and that hooded figure escaped. Let's do it, Captain America said as Black Widow entered a code that gave her access to every CCTV camera in the city. Working for S.H.I.E.L.D. has certain advantages. On the night of the kidnapping, she typed for the videos while the monitor presented the video. There, he said, pointing to a video in the upper right corner. I got it, Black Widow murmured a little before typing a code that pulled up footage of crossbone sightings. Eventually, 11 movies were exhibited in order on the monitor and played backwards to reveal correspondence to get a better look at their mask-wearing adversary until the final video showed Crossbones and his men shooting their weapons at a bar. It has to be O'Connell's bar on Beacon Hill. The soldier with the star bangle opened the door and respectfully requested the captain. The police officer entered the room a minute later, his gaze fixed on the video in O'Connell's bar. Do you recognize that bar? The captain stroked his neck and said, yeah. I knew the owner, his name is Connor O'Connell. I couldn't believe it when I heard the call and arrived at the scene, his body had not been found. Did you try his home? Captain America said of the officer, who nodded, he wasn't there, either, where do you think he is? I don't know, but if he survived, I wouldn't blame him for wanting to leave the city, the police captain said after a brief pause, poor Medusa. When they heard that, Black Widow and Captain America exchanged glances, Medusa. Right. She was a bartender at Connor's bar, sweet girl and all, probably the only decent job she ever got. Do you know where she is? Black Widow inquired. The captain's head shook. No, all I know is that after Connor went missing, I interviewed them, and they didn't mention anything strange or problems he might have had with anyone. They were distraught about what happened to Connor and hoped for his safety. What do you think? Black Widow asked Captain America, who was debating the next move, Cap. We question Connor's associate and investigate his background. The police captain took a step forward, visibly upset. Sir, Connor has absolutely nothing to do with. Captain, I'm not saying Connor was involved in the kidnapping. Crossbones is a mercenary, and I'm betting his employer wants something from O'Connell's past, Captain America stated calmly as the officer visibly calmed. What do you know about him? Where do I begin? T-T-I-I-P-M-X-T-T-I-I-P-M-X-T-T-I-I-P-M Homestead Grounds, Connors Manor. Massachusetts is forested. The grown-ups were sitting on couches in the reading room after placing the children in their cribs in their new room on the second level. The fireplace was filled with burning wood, infusing the area with warmth that made them feel at home and relaxed. They were seated on a couch large enough to accommodate all of them, 
but only two received a body pillow. Their interests, however, were also aligned with the single adult male in the manor. Their gazes were drawn to Naruto's now clean book, which had Connor's secret society logo with 13 stars surrounding it. They were amused rather than intrigued because their beloved had been attempting to open the book for the past three hours with no success. Naruto's physical power after the Winter War allowed him to simply rip the book in half with his fingertips, but the book appeared to be stronger than the blonde. Open you. Mumbled the tick marked Naruto as a vein began to throb. Despite groaning under the pressure of Naruto's might, the book refused to open. The ninja eventually relaxed and let go of his might, appearing to give up for a brief period. This must be made of adamantine or something. Rhea had stared at the book when she first saw it, a familiar and faint sense emanating from it. She eventually gave it some thought, but she wanted to make sure it was what she suspected. Naruto. Naruto and the others gazed at her. May I have a look at it? Sure. Naruto said without hesitation as he handed Rhea the book. The Titaness examined the book from cover to cover and side to side before placing it on her lap with the assassin symbol facing her. Rhea? What exactly is it? This book has been enchanted. Enchanted? Rhea nodded, and the group repeated with question marks above their heads. Magic protects this book. It's not surprising if Connor wanted to protect his order's secrets, but I didn't know he knew magic. Did you both? She said of Naruto and Medusa, who shook their heads. Perhaps this could only be opened by someone who knows magic. Can you dispel the enchantment, Rhea? Inquired Seiko. She was curious about the abilities of one of history's oldest fabled people after Naruto mentioned her in their last talk. I could, but there's a chance the spell will backlash against all of you. Except me and Naruto, Rhea replied honestly, while Naruto shook his head at Medusa, Seiko, and Kuroka being hurt. I think it's only Naruto who can open it. In case you didn't notice, Rhea, I already tried, Naruto stated dryly. Perhaps it's password protected, Medusa said when Rhea returned the book to Naruto's hands. Did Connor say anything strange or out of the ordinary, Naruto? Not really, Naruto shrugged before speaking aloud about the events leading up to Connor's death. He said about the manor and homestead being mine, that they should be better than they were in the order, and, he gave me a name. Kuroka cocked her head, her two tails swishing in the air, a name? Connor said that the mentor, which I assume is the order's leader, is given a name that best describes that person, Naruto explained to the girls as he struggled to recall the name Connor had given him. Petron, no, no. Maxi Pat, no. He smacked his skull to get his brain to work faster. Ah, it was Patronus Maximus. The book flew out of Naruto's hands and levitated in the middle of the reading room, much to everyone's surprise. The book's cover opened as a sky-blue mist escaped from it before it became corporeal and something they were all familiar with and who had lately died. Connor. The ghost of Connor didn't see Medusa's name since his gaze was fixated on the one in charge of the book. When the ghost appeared from the book, the females focused their attention on Naruto, who had jumped behind the couch. His head was barely above the outline of the couch. None of you saw that. Naruto stared at them as they whistled innocently with smirks on their faces before standing up and looking at the ghost. Connor, is that you? Patronus Maximus, you have already opened the codex. My order would have put you through several trials to see if your skills and commitment are great enough to officially join us. That was the old days, and I was the only one left of my kind, so I deemed you as one of us. You will face great challenges in your struggle to protect humanity's free will and those who wish to destroy that notion. The group exchanged glances as the ghost continued to talk while gesticulating to the book beside him. This codex contains centuries of events, encounters, and valuable knowledge from past mentors before you and I, beginning with Achilles Davenport's disciple and the one who rebuilt our branch, Connor, but he was known by his birth name that I could never pronounce in my life. Wait, you saw a branch, do you mean the order wasn't based in America? Naruto inquired. The ghost flickered briefly. The American branch of the Brotherhood descended from the colonial assassins during the revolution in the 1700s. There were many branches around the world, including the Caribbean, Great Britain, France, the Middle East, and Spain, but we were all under one banner. All right, but what if I need advice on what to do? The Codex will guide you, and hopefully your experiences will make you a better assassin than myself and those who came before us. The ghost flared more prominently, indicating that the time limit is approaching, in case you're concerned about the safety of your loved ones and yourself, the Fidelius Charm protects the homestead, as well as the manor and cove. The Fidelius Charm. 
The codex contains information about the charm within its contents, so you will learn more about it once I depart. Connor's spirit flickered once more until his ghostly body began to fade away minute by minute. I must depart right now. Wait, I have a very important question. What exactly is it? Do you know where we can shower? Naruto said, his earnestness shared with his girls. The waterfall near the cove, now farewell, Patronus Maximus. After the codex descended on the wooden table in front of the couches, the ghost vanished just as the new inhabitants sat in the reading room. The silence was broken when Rhea giggled to herself and looked at her younger adults, who had raised their brows in confusion. The name he gave you, Naruto, it's Latin. You know Latin? Both Seiko and Kuroka inquired. I am immortal, and I was worshipped as ops to the Romans during their reign. Rhea replied before raising her hand when Naruto was ready to speak. I'm sure you're wondering, what does Patronus Maximus mean? It translates to, greatest protector. Greatest protector, huh? Naruto asked again, his tone tense, Patronus Maximus, I like it. Kuroka and Seiko placed their arms around his neck with approval, while Medusa and Rhea slowly unraveled their garments. So do we, Seiko said on behalf of everyone, and Uzumaki Manor does have a better ring to it. The quintet traveled to the aforementioned waterfall via Shunshine after saying nothing further and constructing a clone to guard the children. Naruto will study the codex later, but first he needs to take a bath with his lovely girlfriends. TTIIPMXTTIIPMXTTIIPM, the following day, with his eyes awake, Naruto slowly rose from his cozy bed and kissed his sleeping beauty before strolling to the reading room. Naruto began flipping through the pages of the codex after stating his given mentor name to access it, reading the information from each mentor before him in the order's procedures. These techniques mostly featured assassinations, but they also included stealth, combat, investigation methods, and the three tenets of their creed. He wanted to discover more about the enchantment stated by Connor's ghost that presumably protects the homestead and tried to scan through to the conclusion, but the pages were never ending. What the hell? Naruto exclaimed, surprised that the codex had not run out of pages. This must be the charm mentioned by Rhea. I'd like to learn more about the Fi, Fed, Fred, Fidelius charm. The codex vanished from his grasp and began turning pages on its own until it came to a halt on a specific page. Naruto took the book and opened it to the page containing information on the Fidelius charm. Can this obey my commands or thoughts? That's cool. You know, even though I saw this after the old man sage's training, I still can't believe it. What, Karama? You're doing some reading. Shut up. Naruto snarled at the tailed beast as he studied the Fidelius charm material. The charm is an ancient, sophisticated, and powerful enchantment that makes a place or area unplottable, which means it is invisible, soundproof, and only the secret keeper knows about it. As a result, the homestead is unplottable and invisible to prying eyes. Shield must be included as well. Man, we're lucky to have this house, Naruto murmured seriously, pausing to consider the weaponry he briefly employed against crossbones. Show me the weapons of the Brotherhood, he said, and the codex flipped through the seemingly infinite pages until it came to a halt at the requested area, where Naruto first noticed the weapons he'd briefly employed against the mercenary. The first was the rope dart, but the second piqued his interest the most. The title refers to, the hidden blade. As Naruto read the very large part of the hidden blade, he discovered that it has been the hallmark weapon of the assassins from the inception of the order and has been updated over the years. Originally, in order to employ the hidden blade, Members had to amputate their left ring finger as a sign of their abilities and dedication. Ouch, that had to hurt. He continued reading through the part that led to the variants generated by the other branches until he came to the colonial branches variation. The pivot blade is a pivot blade. Naruto read the inscription from the mentor who was active following the revolution. The pivot blade is a trustworthy and valuable companion of mine, passed down by my mentor Achilles Davenport, its design allows me to pivot the hidden blade to be wielded as a dagger, perfect for open combat and assassination, but there is a thought that troubled my mind. Should the blade ever be broken, the Brotherhood would be robbed of a valuable weapon against the Templar. Naruto paused because the inscription was above a graphic depicting the pivot blade's design and mechanism, as well as the protective gauntlets dated 1790. A circular mineral with comprehensive annotations and remarks around the sketch. More of Connor's namake's inscription appeared beneath the diagram. Years passed like seasons, but with the assistance of one of my former and now master assassin recruits, 
I discovered and carefully traced the design of the pivot blade for future generations to wield as their own. The mineral shown above was discovered by the miner on the homestead, and I in turn brought the mineral to Benjamin Franklin for assistance. He met Benjamin Franklin? Naruto applauded before continuing to read. The elderly founding father as he was called by the colonists informed me the metal was unlike anything he had ever seen and claimed it be much stronger than most if not all the metals known to man at this time. Mr. Franklin had compared the mineral to one in Greek mythology that was wielded by the Olympian gods due to its hardness and the gold entrancing color. Intrigue had me vexed and I asked him for the name of the mythical metal. Naruto came to a halt since the name of the mineral was underlined three times on the left bottom corner of the page. Adamantine. His eyes blinked owlishly as he comprehended what the Codex had just told him. Does the metal also exist here? This is a different dimension, Naruto, but my father did mention about each one bearing similarities like the continents and the apparent mythologies, Ashura explained after recalling one of his father's interdimensional travel classes, this must also apply to metals. Is that correct? Naruto pondered the trident Poseidon had given him in Soul Universe. Naruto had returned the weapon to the Olympian days before their departure because his position as commander of the Greek faction was only temporary to begin with. The sea deity did, however, indicate the power being with him for all eternity. I guess we should finish reading it, Naruto said, continuing to read the adamantine portion. The name, adamantine, piqued my interest, and I began to think about improving the hidden blade and our weapons with this metal against the Templars. Naruto quit writing from that year till the month of August 1790. Months passed with no significant progress on my proposal of improving the hidden blade with adamantine metal. With that thought in mind, I had no choice but to safeguard the metal here in the homestead to be protected by the Brotherhood but remain a secret known only to the mentor after myself. I do have hope that the metal will assist the Brotherhood in the future. The ninja exhaled the breath he'd held back unintentionally after reading a piece of history that nearly no one gets to experience. Before he can call himself an assassin, he must first create his own weapons to aid him in his quest to protect the innocent. The hidden blades, rope dart, and the robes he wore that night to save the mayor and his family all belong to Connor and should be returned to him unless there are special circumstances. Codex, show me where the adamantine metal is located, he said, and the codex flipped to a blank page that subsequently extended and spread out like a folded map, showing a sketch of the homestead during the colonial period and a clue to its position. I guess I'm going to get a gold rush. TTIIPMX TTIIPMX TTIPM, after six hours, Beacon Hill is a neighborhood in Boston. Boston is a city in Massachusetts. Citizens were walking or driving without fear because they thought everything would be alright. A dark-skinned woman in a green top with contrasting slacks and heels was arguing with the owner of a convenience shop over something crucial. New York Yankees, exclaimed the crowd. No, the Boston Red Sox. Anya, wait out here. Despite residing in Red Sox territory, the young girl with black hair watched her mother argue about the Red Sox winning the World Series this year, and the store owner was just as passionate about the New York Yankees. Anya rolled her eyes as she walked outside with her lollipop until she discovered a lone dollar in the middle of the sidewalk directly in front of her feet. The dollar was whisked away by the soft breeze as she bent forward to pick it up, but it wasn't high enough. Anya jumped in the air her hands almost touching the green currency as it floated away from her, tempted to have more money and a lollipop in her mouth. She kept jumping for the money as she ran away from the business, animatedly arguing. Anya was so intent on getting the money that she didn't notice she had just jumped into the middle of the busy street as her hands finally seized its reward. Anya. Hearing her mother's scream, Anya whirled around, but this allowed her to see the incoming automobile, which had the horn blaring and what appeared to be firearms pointed out the windows, when she tried to move, fear clutched her heart, but her body refused to heed her instruction no matter how many times she tried. Anya's mother had closed her eyes and covered her face with her hands. She whimpered as she cautiously peered back, hoping that her daughter was safe. Anya wasn't lying on the street with torn wounds, therefore her hope wasn't in vain. No, she was on the other side of the street, in someone's arms. Anya. Anya opened her eyes when she heard her mother's words and saw a hooded figure with a heavily shadowed face. When Anya spotted her mother approaching, she went to her and hugged her tightly, which was warmly reciprocated. The mother and daughter's cries resonated softly on the suddenly crowded street, which was filled with worried neighbors and passersby. Anya, are you okay? The mother received a nod from her daughter and tightened her hold. She turned to say, thank you for save, 
Her daughter's savior was no longer in the spot where he had transported Anya to safety. Where is he? The crowd searched around for the hooded man, but no one noticed the Victorian row house's roof. Those guys are going to get it. Naruto snarled as he sprinted across the roofs with ease. Those bank thieves would have ran over the small girl carelessly. As Naruto strives to keep up with the fast van pursued by police squad cars, he's hopped over air conditioners, steamers, and sheds with one leap. Naruto had planned to practice the assassin's free-running form at the homestead today, but he decided to do so while patrolling through Boston's busy population. That illusion was shattered when he heard an alarm nearby and observed the vehicle fleeing the area. He was going to intercept them, but the little girl was out on the street at the same time. Naruto came to a halt at the edge of a big gap between row houses and an open plaza, waiting for the speeding car to approach. It didn't take long for tires to screech, and the aforementioned automobile took a wide bend to avoid the squad cars. Time to get to work, Naruto said as he launched off the roof vertically, his body flipping over in midair before his feet were pointed like a spear. He showed no symptoms of discomfort when he landed on the roof of the perpetrator's getaway car, nor did he react when it swerved violently until it came to a stop in front of a retail center. The crooks, four of them, immediately exited the car and pointed their firearms at the hooded figure who had stopped their getaway, and they were scared by the look of it. The figure was dressed in black slacks fastened by a black belt with a modified, A, with its stands curved inwards, over a navy blue undershirt and a long black robe, howry with form-fitting sleeves, orange lining, and layered at the lower half. A stylized orange swirl was in the center of the back of the howry, with two form-fitting orange gloves covering the hands until the forearms and a beaked cowl covering his head and shadowing his face. Ray's talents allowed her to create the robe, howry, gloves, and swirl. In terms of weaponry, a rolled-up rope dart was clipped to his belt, while his two hidden blades were carefully hidden beneath his sleeves, as is customary with the American Brotherhood. The crooks were terrified since they couldn't see the figure's face because of the hood and the black katana strapped to his back. One chance, murmured the stranger, softly but menacingly. Lower your weapons and surrender peacefully, he said as he noticed the cops had built up a cordon and pointed their weapons at them, not at him. But that was the hope. Naruto sighed loudly for them to hear as their rifles remained leveled at him. All right, you just signed your death warrants. When the four criminals cried out in pain after the hooded figure took them down with grapples, takedowns, and punches, the surrounding police officers flinched and winced. When something approached him, one of the officers grabbed it with his hand. It was a bag. Full with money. The money from a bank that was recently looted. There you go, officers. Naruto yelled loudly, seeming to be older than the uniformed men. Naruto threw a smoke pellet on the ground and left the location with a shunshin before the officers could approach him, landing over a nearby roof to witness the offenders being carried away. The day isn't over yet. He turned around and dashed across the rooftop intending to continue patrolling all of Boston's neighborhoods while mentally noting supplies for the girls and children. TTIIPMXTTIIPMXTTIIPM, after three hours, throughout the three hours, Naruto had saved 40 people from a runaway bus, averted a jewelry heist, protected a couple of females from attacks, and finally saved an entire building of people from being roasted alive by fire. The last heroic feat relied heavily on prudence and subtle water ninjutsu applications. Naruto was about to jump over a street to another building as he doubled back to the downtown district of Boston, hoping for no more crimes, when a spotlight suddenly shone in his eyes and froze him in his place on the rooftop. The cops? Naruto raised his arm to shield his eyes. Before it dropped in front of him, his eyes detected something briefly blocking the light. The light dimmed enough for the hooded ninja to realize it was a person. A man dressed in a blue tight uniform with red and white stripes and a lone star on his chest, holding a discus shield in his left hand. Who exactly are you? Well, that's a first. I've never known anyone who doesn't know who I am. The first Avenger couldn't help but feel comforted. Hello, my name is Captain America. Naruto shrugged as he and Cap began to circle around each other, watching each other. First time for everything, I suppose. He watched the way his probable adversary walked and knew Captain America was an accomplished fighter, especially with that shield. Most likely, he developed his own fighting style with the weapon. This might be tricky. Meanwhile, the Cap was thinking about the cloaked figure in the same way. His attentive stance exudes the aura of a great fighter educated in either his own fighting technique or numerous martial arts. If they have to fight, he believes it will be a close fight, which neither Black Widow nor himself want right now. 
they would now try to persuade the crew of the helicarrier and Nick Fury, who is curious about the cloaked man. We'd like to talk with you about something, such as? The kidnapping of the mayor and his family. How about it? Naruto inquired. S.H.I.E.L.D. wants a thorough report from everyone involved in the incident. You mean you want to bring me in because the boss doesn't trust me? Surprising the star spangle wearing man, Naruto stated bluntly. Here's your report, I stopped a maniac and his goons, saved the mayor and his family, and narrowly escaped a bomb. The maniac's name is Crossbones. Naruto knowingly raised his non-existent brow, and he's also one of yours. What exactly do you mean? Enemies? Villains? Naruto looked over his shoulder for any possible escape routes. So far, he's discovered two, but one of them, like the pathway that connected Connor's tavern, leads back to the homestead by magical methods. Anyway, if you'll excuse me, I'm about to retire for the night. Please, it'll only take a few minutes of your time. Captain America begged him to change his mind. I only told you what happened, and you can tell the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. that he, she can kiss my ass if they don't like it. Naruto turned around to return home, missing the captain's sigh. His instincts ignited behind him, and he turned on his heels, right arm in the air, grabbing the shield with his bare hand. Captain America was taken aback by the hooded figure's ease in seizing his shield, despite his customary power. However, the mysterious vigilante caught it with ease, indicating that there is more to the hooded person than meets the eye. Let's go play then. Naruto laughed before hurling the shield with greater force at the original owner. Oh, and by the way, the name is Patronus. Captain grabbed the shield but was taken off surprise as he was pushed back due to his boot's inability to get traction. He managed to stop himself just at the edge of the rooftop and sprinted ahead to meet the cloaked figure's attack before slamming his shield at him. When Patronus saw the shield, he leaned back and effortlessly dodged the attack before launching a roundhouse kick. Captain, on the other hand, saw it coming and reacted with an unexpected inside punch to the gut, but Patronus intercepted it with his palm and leapt with his feet curled before kicking him in the chest firmly. As the first Avenger used momentum to roll backwards and rise up, Naruto flipped himself up from a handstand, and both warriors quickly engaged in shield-to-shield -shield combat. Captain noted that all of his shield strikes were blocked by Patronus' forearms as huge boom noises resonated from each contact as they countered each other's blows and counters. Patronus threw an open palm towards Captain America's chest after diverting one of his blows, but the latter abruptly leaned backwards while fast kicking him in the chin. He received the blow without flinching, then pushed him back and unleashed another open palm thrust. Captain America anticipated it and responded with his shield, which will reflect the force back at the cloaked man. Patronus chose to demonstrate his new weapon, which he had constructed with Rhea back at the homestead, as a golden, retractable blade extended from his wrist and made contact with the shield. The two warriors were astonished, however, when neither of their projected results occurred, as they were blown apart after their weapons briefly echoed within a flash of gold and silver. Patronus took advantage of his opponent's distraction and flew away in a whirlwind of leaves. Captain America stood up with ringing ears and breathed deeply when he no longer saw the cloaked person. Steve headed to the cockpit where his comrade was piloting and gave him a glance as the Quinjet descended and he entered. What? That could have gone another way. I wanted to build trust with him, Captain America responded truthfully. It appeared he has little faith in S.H.I.E.L.D., perhaps you shouldn't have brought it up. As she piloted the Quinjet back to the police station, Black Widow briefed him, and yet another thing. Yes. Look down at your S.H.I.E.L.D., Captain America did so and discovered a very faint slash mark cut into the adamantium, vibranium shield. Do you think that blade of his is made of the same material? Let's make our way to the helicarrier and report to Fury. Roger, that. TTIIPMXTTIIPMXTTIIPM Uzumaki Manor in the homestead grounds. Massachusetts is forested. Man, that guy's punches had some power. Naruto looked around after exiting the tunnel. He was now in the manor's basement which Kuroka found after being frightened by a cockroach. The only way in was to grab a candle from beneath the stairway. Naruto strolled through the armory, which housed many weapons from the colonial era to the contemporary age, such as flintlock pistols, Winchester rifles, tomahawks, swords, and many more, until he came to a halt at the lone practice dummy. The ninja peered behind him and noticed open wooden cases containing numerous assassin robes from various time periods. According to the Codex, the robes were previously worn by renowned assassins of the Brotherhood's American branch, who also became mentors once each one died. 
Naruto had placed Connor's robes in the last cupboard to respect his passing and to retire the apparel. Naruto stood there after taking off his hood, examining the entire basement layout before leaving and closing the entrance. Naruto sighed as he strolled through the peaceful house to the second floor, stopping at a room, opening the door, and entering. He slowly approached the two cribs that stood next to each other and smiled when he saw his sleeping children. Kurama and Ashura awaited him as he stood there, watching his children sleep happily and innocently. The tailed beast and Ninshu's successor, like their father, pledged to protect them and unleash their vengeance on anybody who harms them. Naruto entered his and the girls' bedroom next door as he caught sight of them sleeping on the queen-sized bed and smiled at them before strolling to the closet adjacent to the fireplace, closing the door behind him. When he opened it, Naruto began to strip and placed his own robes as well as the weapons inside. His hidden blades were the only weapons he kept on himself. Naruto couldn't help but notice his two wrist-mounted weapons after leaving nothing but boxers. They were leather bracers with gold metal plates on the other side and two fox-carved handles at his wrists. With a flick, he saw his weapons emerge quickly, revealing their golden blades in all their splendor. Instead of using ordinary metal, Naruto discovered the adamantine on the map and fashioned it into his own hidden blades. The whole hidden blade mechanism, metal plates, and blades are all composed of adamantine, making them much stronger than earlier iterations. Naruto softly went into bed, retracing them safely back into the bracer, where his girls promptly nestled against him while sleeping. Naruto smiled as he closed his eyes and stepped out of the dreamland, hoping that the next day would bring him and his family good fortune. To be continued. That's it for this podcast and for this video. I hope you did enjoy the part of the story. And if you did, like, share, and subscribe for more. And thank you all for having support. And have a great day.